Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues, and thank you for joining the webinar today on Agenda Item 9 on Mechanisms for Reporting, Assessment and Review or Implementation of the Fund Meeting of a Subsidiary Board of Implementation. At the outset, I would like to invite Mr. David Cooper, Deputy Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity, to provide us with a few remarks. So, Mr. Cooper, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Charlotte and uh, dear colleagues. Um, I'd also like to welcome you on behalf of Elizabeth Marema, the Executive Secretary, to this webinar today on mechanisms for reporting, assessment and review of implementation. I hope that you're all doing well, despite the difficult and uncertain times that we're, we're currently living through. As you are all aware, the third meeting of the subsidiary body on implementation will be a crucial meeting on our path towards COP15 in Kunming, China. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Charlotte, the SBI chair, for her leadership in preparing for this important meeting. I'm certain that under her guidance, we'll be able to make the most of the opportunities before us. Now, today we're looking at the documents for agenda item nine. And we know that this is a, a complex issue. There are many interrelated uh, issues. Uh, and this issue will have implications for how the convention operates in, in the future. We know from many parties that the need to enhance our review, reporting, monitoring, um, uh, mechanisms uh, are regarded as important for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. Um, so the discussions on this agenda item at the um, upcoming SBI meeting are likely to be challenging, but I'm confident that with the guidance of the SBI chair and with all your support, we'll be able to arrive at, at very good outcomes. Um, the recommendations that come from this agenda item will be crucial, not only for the development and adoption of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, but also for the further implementation of the Convention generally. So, dear colleagues, the year ahead will be a very important one in the, in the life of the Convention. While the COVID-19 pandemic continues to create much uh, loss and hardship and uncertainty. I'm confident that together we can rise to the challenges that we face. Um, the whole Secretariat um, stands ready to support you um, as you as parties continue to prepare the ground for the adoption of an ambitious and transformative post-2020 global biodiversity framework to put the world on a path to reach the 2050 vision for biodiversity. So I look forward to good presentations and discussions uh, today. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cooper, for those remarks and for being here today with us today. And I am optimistic that this series of webinars will put us in a better position to have a fruitful meeting of SBI free. I will also like to thank you and the whole Secretariat for your support in facilitating these workshops. Dear colleagues, I would like to thank you for joining us today and dedicating your time to this webinar on SBI Agenda Item 9, especially as I know that many of you also joined us on Tuesday for this webinar on Agenda Item 5. Like the Deputy Executive Secretary, I think Agenda Item 9 is particularly important for moving forward into a post-2020 period. Without effective planning, monitoring, review and reporting, we will not be able to achieve the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. And thus, it is important that we get this item right and are able to have strong recommendations at SPI 3. 
The issue of enhancing review and reporting mechanism is also linked to a monitoring framework, which will be presented during the SAP 22 Agenda Item 3 webinar on 26th of January. During this session today, we will receive an overview of a proposal contained in the SPI documents under this agenda item. This includes the main elements of a proposal, which are included in SPI 3 11, and the supporting documents on the 7th National Reporting Template and possible National Commitment Template. All of the documents for this agenda item are available online on SPI Free main page. Before I begin, I would also like to remind everyone that this webinar is intended to assist parties and observers in becoming more familiar with the documentation for SPI Free, its structure and content, and to respond to questions from participants. It is not a negotiation session, and the statements, views expressed during the webinars will not be considered part of official work of SPI. In order to ask a question during today's session, please use the question window located at the right of your screen. You are free to ask questions at any point during the webinar. And when asking a question, please include your name, and party or organization affiliation in order to help us better manage the questions. I would also like to mention that we'll have the introductory presentations after which we'll address any questions you may have. Following that, we'll have presentation on national reporting and national commitments. We will hold any questions on national reporting and national commitment until the presentation on those two is issues. Lastly, I would also like to inform you that today's session is being recorded and will be made available on the Convention's website later in, in the week, along with the presentations that have been made. And with those remarks, I would now like to hand over to the Secretariat again for an introduction to the agenda item. So Secretariat, Judy, you have the floor. Thanks a lot, Charlotte, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, and welcome to this uh, webinar, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I just wanted to give a basic overview of uh, why um, these documents have been produced and why uh, we, you know, why this is so important. So I will begin at, uh, uh, with Article 23 of the Convention. Um, as you know, Article 23 of the Convention uh, states that the main job of the conference of the parties is to keep the implementation of the Convention under review. And so in, in doing that, for doing that in the upcoming post-2020 uh, period, um, we have um, put together a package based on the discussions that were that took place at the consultations at the margins of the uh, Rome meeting, the post-2020 meeting, submissions from parties, past decisions that have been taken, um, uh, plus some outcomes from Sharm el Sheikh. So it is a uh, package that was requested by um, the by the parties to us, uh, the Secretariat, to put together, and we have done that based on all the input we have received from parties, mostly, and also from, uh, from other stakeholders and observers. Um, so it is a package. Uh, it is a package of elements uh, for enhancing the multidimensional review approach uh, that the Convention already undertakes. Um, so, uh, the, and the overarching objective of the proposed planning, reporting, and review mechanism that you're going to hear about today is to provide an improved pathway uh, for stimulating and supporting the commitments and actions from parties and other stakeholders in order to implement the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework and achieve the goals and targets set in 
uh, that that are adopted within that uh, global biodiversity framework. As you know, we had um, some issues or a lot of issues as GBO5 and our uh, document um, for agenda item three, uh, which you will find also on the uh, on the website, have identified that a lot of the IG targets and the strategic plan were not met. Um, and um, or maybe I'm really understating that, but it is a fact, and therefore we have to rethink. And the parties have been rethinking how um, the review of uh, implementation um, could be enhanced. And therefore they requested us to do this. And you will um, find in the next presentation a more detailed presentation. But just before I hand this over to my colleague. Uh, colleagues, I wanted to provide you uh, a little bit of an outline of what um, the uh, what the mechanism aims to do. It it aims to provide an enhanced transparency and responsibility for implementation uh, mechanism. Uh, it is a means of providing uh, and identifying uh, addressing gaps in both commitments and implementation. Uh, it, it is about strengthening and enhancing the capacity and information sharing throughout the implementation process. Um, and so, you know, we are hoping all of these will put a good package together. Um, the process itself should minimize the reporting burden and allow for action. And that is something that we are, um, are um, that, you know, that we have heard uh, from the uh, from uh, the different consultations and submissions, and it is something that we are uh, we are um, providing in this uh, hopefully uh, in this uh, enhanced mechanism, and we are also providing an increased opportunity for engagement um, with subnational and non-state actors and enhancing linkages with other processes, including the Sustainable uh, Development Goals. Um, there are the, the following elements are uh, part of the proposal: national uh, commitments or contributions towards the targets and goals that are agreed um, by um, uh, for the uh, through the global biodiversity framework, uh, not only for parties but also for non-state actors, indigenous peoples, local communities, and stakeholders. A national reporting, which is um, which will um, uh, which continues as is part of the uh, of the um, convention, a country by country review process under the subsidiary body on implementation, and you will hear a little bit more about that, and a global analytical review, and you'll hear a little bit more about that too. Um, so um, I hope that you will. Uh, I think we have a presentation now by Jillian, and she can put that up, and we can uh, we we can uh, start on that. Thanks a lot, Jillian. Yes, thank thank you very thank you very much, Jyoti. So I would now like to hand over to Jillian from the Secretariat for the first presentation. Thank you. I'm. I apologize. I. I'm just trying to get my screen to share. It, Karen, it says waiting to share your screen. Okay, now it doesn't say that anymore. Sorry, guys. Um, so are you able to see it now? Yes, I can see it. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so there you go, Jody. So just a to quickly recap, um, as was mentioned, we are going to hear a presentation on the elements that are in the proposal that is contained in the document CBI, I mean, SBI 311. And as was mentioned, um, so this was mentioned already, as was mentioned, there are documents available online. Um, these are the document numbers for the documents that are available 
online. So it's 3 slash 11 and 3 slash 11 add 1, 3 slash 11 add 2, and there is also 3 slash 11 imp 3, which is up on the analysis of the six national reporting process. Um, we'll hear more about the national reporting processes later in this session. There's additional documentation in preparation, um, and once it is ready, it will be posted on the, the same site. So you will be able to find everything as it becomes available. Um, so this, I'm going to just quickly start with an overview of what the proposal looks like. And as was mentioned by Jyoti, this proposal is, is based on the consultations that have happened up to this point and uh, the, the various feedback that parties have provided on what an enhanced review and reporting system could look like. So a few things that I would like to highlight in this figure is that the proposal is aiming to provide the, the COP with the necessary information to really understand what the current state of affairs is and to address that through ratcheting up. And so in the proposal, there is a, an element related to national commitments um, and commitments from other stakeholders, and these being harmonized in order to allow the analysis of the gap between the commitments being made and the ambition of the GBF. Um, this is something that we will talk about more later in this session, um, and you will hear additional present an additional presentation on this. But I think that this is one of the, the key elements of the proposal is to ensure that the that the parties have the information necessary to achieve the, the goal of being able to really review the current state of affairs and to try to address any gaps that exist in terms of implementation. Um, one of the things that this that underlines the entire system, as you see on the bottom of this graphic on the screen, is having a, a biodiversity information monitoring system, which would include indicators. It would also include other information, um, such as publications. In terms of the indicators, I, I just want to highlight here that this is a proposal that's also being discussed in the SAPSTA um, and under agenda item three. And there will be a webinar on Tuesday of next week at this same time um, on these indicators. And the linkage between the indicators and the monitoring framework and the um, and the global review mechanism and the national review mechanism comes up again and again in, in the comments from parties and, and also is included in both documents. And so there is definitely overlaps between these two. And so you know, I think that that might also be useful for, for people online to consider next week attending. Um, so obviously na national biodiversity strategies and action plans and the national reporting process, which are the main current instruments under the convention, are expected to continue and be strengthened. Um, and it is anticipated that the global stock taking will also continue, as I said, with this global gap analysis as an additional element to really try to understand the, the difference between the commitments and the ambition. Um, this is something that it is taking some of the experiences learned in the UNFCCC process. For those of you who are familiar with the emissions gap report, uh, it is, of course, more difficult for biodiversity to estimate this gap, but uh, it would be ideal if the, the parties are able to really understand and have this information at their fingertips. And this is something that has certainly been recognized in this process. And so this proposal takes that into account. So just to put the, the graphic that was on the previous slide in sort of a list format, um, there are these key elements of the system, which include mobilizing national commitments and commitments of non-state actors uh, immediately after the COP15. And by immediately, this is within one year after the, the COP15, particularly the national commitments. Um, the NBSAP updating and revision in order to ensure that the post-2020 global biodiversity framework 
is actionable, is also part of the system, national reporting, um, and trying to strengthen the uh, consistency of information in national reports in order to best feed into this global analysis is another element that will be discussed later on. The country by country review process. So this is the open-ended forum where we've already had a trial forum in September. The global analytical review, which includes the gap report and the stock take. And then of course, as I mentioned, the monitoring framework is, is linked to the to this system as well. Um, the two in bold on this slide will be covered later in the session. This was already mentioned also, and, and so we will have questions on those after the two presentations on those two uh, aspects of this system. I also just want to quickly mention here that the reason why um, there is documentation on these two elements is because of the timing. Um, these, as was mentioned, are expected to, to happen quite quickly. And so, therefore, um, in order for us to have a successful SBI session, or for the parties to have a successful SBI session, um, the Secretariat is, is trying to pull together the information that we have received through the feedback so far in order to, to provide further information on the aspects of the proposal related to these topics. So, the national commitments and contributions towards the global goals and targets, um, as was mentioned, are proposed to be within the first year after COP. These could be also national targets. Um, the, the proposal here is really that the targets or commitments would or contributions would be submitted in a standardized way in order to really understand the contribution towards each goal and target so that this would allow better consistency and analysis at the global level. Um, and it would also help with aligning the information on national targets with the global targets in order to increase the transparency and accountability as was highlighted in the SBI Agenda Item 5 documentation. And it was mentioned also in the webinar on Tuesday. Uh, there would the proposal would be that this would be through a clearinghouse in a standardized format um, as that would be a way to to really harmonize the format of these and to facilitate the analysis. Um, this proposal also includes an element related to the commitments of non-state actors. Um, this is currently voluntary and it would be it would continue to be voluntary. However, um, Many of the, the pledges thus far are difficult to analyze because they have not followed a real standardized form. And so the, the aspiration here would be also to be able to better understand the commitments of non-state actors in a way that will allow this analysis and will put parties in a position so that they have this information for understanding what these commitments look like and for ensuring that um, the commitments are followed up and also include an additional feedback to see if they are successful over time. Um, and, and this is something, as I mentioned, that we are preparing additional documentation on to submit to parties so that they have this prior to the SBI meeting um, as an information document. Um, so all the commitments would be then able to be aggregated so that this gap report could be prepared. In terms of the national planning, uh, national planning, the NBSAPs would continue to be the main vehicle for national biodiversity planning. Um, the, in the past, the analysis of the NBSAP found that very few of the NBSAPs were a whole of government approach based on a variety of different issues related to um, how the NBSAPs were created. And so in the proposal, the NBSAPs would be flexible to try to provide a whole of government approach. Um, this would include both vertical and horizontal whole of government. And this would be in order to, to ensure that the NBSAP is really focused on 
national level action and implementation, and therefore the timing and the, the structure would be contextual to the to the national circumstances. And so the national commitment contribution, which was just mentioned, would then be sort of a bridge between the targets in the NBSAP and the uh, global processes where the NBSAP would be flexible and then the national contribution submission would elaborate how those targets, how those national targets that are contained and, and may include, you know, may even be in native languages, would then translate into the GBF. And so, um, and so this would allow both the NBSAP and the national commitments to, to be very useful in the process. Um, and there should be a feedback loop between planning and reporting. And so if you saw on the previous slide, it is anticipated that there would be a, a ratcheting mechanism. So if the global gap report identifies a gap between the level of commitment or contribution and the global ambition, then that should hopefully stimulate uh, additional action at the national level. And this would then sort of have a, a cyclical process where you would have um, planning, implementation, looking to see where things are working and where they're not, and then identifying and filling those gaps. And so this was also something that came out of the analysis. Um, the NBSAPs, many of them had quite a long timeline, and so the proposal would be to, to do faster, smaller revisions to address issues in, in a faster and more efficient way. Uh, the national reporting, uh, national reports will continue to be the main monitoring and reporting mechanism under the convention. This was as highlighted, it's a, a legal obligation of parties, and obviously this is expected to continue. Uh, the reporting template for the seventh national report will be presented later on in this session. And as was mentioned, there is the proposal that the seven national reports will directly have standardized sections relating to the monitoring framework, which is presented in the SAPSTA 24-3 document. The country by country review process. Um, there was a trial phase of the open ended forum on review of implementation, which was conducted on the 17th of September of 2020. Uh, and this is something that probably many of you attended. And the, there was a survey conducted after that trial. And in general, it, there was support for the open ended forum continuing. Uh, as a way to assess needs and gaps and, and enhance peer-to-peer -peer learning and capacity building and sharing of experiences. Um, however, there was also comments related to clarification still being needed. I, I believe that it probably would be useful to prepare additional documentation that fleshes out what this process could look like. Um, this is something that, that parties will need to consider to, to determine how to take this forward and, and what sort of additional documentation might be needed to inform the discussions. And um, in the proposal, the proposal would be that all countries would have the opportunity to participate in this once during the decade. So there would be three sessions per year over the decade, so a total of maybe 27 sessions at this point. Um, and then the, the parties would be split among those sessions. And so it is true that some of the parties would present at the beginning and some at the end, um, which would provide a way to, to sort of touch base throughout the process. The global analytical review, um, this is something that has been done, of course, under the convention since the beginning. The Global Biodiversity Outlook, uh, was recently released, as probably many of you know. The, the change in the proposal here is, is really that uh, we, will, we are expecting to have this gap analysis where we try to model the relationship between commitments and the aspiration of the post-2020 framework. Um, this sort of gap analysis, it is complicated for biodiversity 
obviously uh, the goals are complex and multifaceted and so this is certainly something that would require additional resources and is um, and would require engagement with a variety of stakeholders in order to get done but it is something that that I seems to be of value based on the comments that have been received by parties. So um, I'm not going to talk about the monitoring framework. Uh, as mentioned, it's it's going to be covered in the SEPTA agenda item three session, which is on Tuesday. And so I just wanted to highlight that here, um, that it does include these headline indicators. It also includes more detailed component and complementary indicators. This is, of course, in the documentation under the SAPSTA agenda item three, and it will be covered on Tuesday. So the key timing for the proposal is that there will be, within one year after COP, a submission of national commitments, um, that MBSAP revisions will be will occur as needed in order to align with the GBF and also with national processes. And then at COP16, there would be the cumulative review of the, the review of the cumulative impact of those contributions. And so this is where the gap report would be in to, to try to understand and promote ratcheting up. Uh, and then by 2024, the national reports would be submitted and, and sort of then we start over until the final review. So that is it from my side. I will now hand back over to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gillian, for that informative presentation. And uh, we'll now take a bit of time to respond to any questions you may have. And uh, in order to ask a question, please use the question window located at the right of your screen. Asking a question also, please remember to include your name and party organization affiliation. So, if, do we have already some questions? Secretariat, Kieran, if you... Yes, uh, yes, Chair, we have, we have, we have a few. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so the, um, the, f the first question um, is, um, it looks, so I'll just read out the question um, for the benefit of everyone. Um, it looks like the only it looks like only the commitments will be reviewed at midterm and final review process at the um, in the proposal. I would like to know how the CBD is considering the role of MBSAPs and how the MBSAPs will be reviewed. Um, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the the number of revisions that have occurred and and anything any information that parties would like to send on the MBSAPs, uh, sort of on how the process has worked, is something that would certainly feed into the COPs in this proposal. Uh, as mentioned, the national commitments or national contributions are expected to be a, a bridge between the MBSAPs and the global process. So if there are targets in the MBSAPs which are relevant to the GBF, then ideally those would then be placed into the standardized form to allow the secretariat to do the global review. And so the proposal really is that this, it's not a separate instrument. It's a way for countries to share their contribution to the GBF. And then it would also be a way for the secretariat to conduct the analysis um, on those contributions. And it would be a way for others to, to conduct analysis and to look at what those contributions look like. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. And Kieran, please read yes. out. Yes. So um, the, the next question is a question for clarification, I think. So the question is, would you mind clarifying what is meant by mobilizing um, commitments? So this is a reference to um, the earlier part of the, the presentation, I believe. Um, yeah. that, does that mean submitting commitments? So I think it's a, a question about what mobilizing actually means. Um, yes, so it means submitting. Uh, in the case of non-state actors, it also, there is an advocacy element which is being proposed. So that in the, so there's two different types of commitments that are proposed in the proposal. That was saying proposed. Um, so there's two different types of commitments. For the national commitments, those would just be submitted within the first year. For the commitments of non-state actors, there is an advocacy component which would 
um, which would be used in order to not only receive commitments, but also to encourage them from different groups and to align with different groups. So I'll, I'll continue with the, the questions, Chair, unless you, unless you tell me otherwise. Um, so uh, the next question is um, related to the country by country review. Um, and the question is, will a country by country review be mandatory or voluntary? I think this is something that the SBI should certainly discuss. Um, in the current proposal, it is mandatory. Uh, however, this is something that would certainly be discussed. And in the current proposal, this is something in terms of uh, how the countries are allocated to those different sessions that I mentioned. If there's three sessions per year, the proposal is suggesting random assignment of countries into those. And the reason why this is and I will say we, we did not, as the secretary, receive much feedback on how countries would be selected for which sessions. And so at the current time, we just uh, said that this would be random. However, this is something that certainly should be discussed by the SBI. So um, I'll, I'll, con I'll continue with um, the questions. So um, this, is, this next question is perhaps for, for Jyoti as uh, the secretary of of SBI. Um, will the additional documents be released six weeks before the SBI informal session? So I believe this is a reference to the documents that um, Jillian mentioned earlier in her presentation and a question about the, the timing for those. Um, so all documents that were requested by the COP have already been uh, already online and available. Um, these are in documents, information documents that we are that we are preparing to help parties um, with their, um, you know, um, uh, discussions and their um, and their reviews within country. And um, since the ideas for some of them have come later rather than earlier, they have come because we have the extra time now, and we've been discussing a lot more within uh, the secretariat and how we can help and support uh, the negotiations and discussions within SDI 3, these may be a little delayed. But all documents that are all intersessional documents for SDI 3 on, under this, um, under this uh, agenda item are already available online. Thanks. So um, I'll, I'll continue with some more questions. And actually, I have, um, I think, three questions in a row, but they're, they're all on this, the same theme. So I'll, I'll, I'll read them all at once. Um, and they have to do with um, national commitments. So it, the question is, will the position of national commitments be, be part of an NBSAP? So I, I, yeah, what's the relationship between national commitments and, and the NBSAP? Um, and is the intention that these commitments would be submitted for all of the goals and targets um, in the, the po that are ultimately adopted in the post-2020 framework? So um, I would actually, I mean, not to skirt the question, but I would ask that we hold off on the questions on national commitments, because I think that after the presentation on that, it will be much clearer. And so I think it's probably better um, to just hold those questions and and then some of them may be addressed through the, the presentation also. So I'm, I'm looking at the, the questions and I, um, there's quite a few, but I believe most of them have to do with, with national um, questions surrounding national commitments. Um, um, okay. So maybe, maybe we can move on to the next set of presentations and then come back to the questions on national commitments. If yes, there um, are sorry. Other, or are sorry, they, I'm, I'm, or... sorry, Charlotte, I've, I've just spotted a, a couple that have come in, and, and okay. they're in, okay. they're, um, they're in relation ahead. to sorry, yes, it, they're they're in relation to the the gap report, and um, there's a there's a number of them. So um, you know who would who would be preparing this gap report? Would the um, identification of identification of gaps be undertaken for each of the the goals and targets, um, and I think I'll stop there. For a yes. 
So I did mention, um, I think there will there will definitely be a, a need for additional documentation on the gap report if this is the decision of the parties. The proposal highlights that the gaps would be in terms of the goals. So the, the targets represent, for the most part, uh, actions that will be taken and uh, activities that are a little closer to to policy and to interventions that can be achieved either by governments or by by people, you know, through reducing pollution and reducing consumption patterns. And so the the theory would then be that you would look at the gaps between those the commitments towards the targets and the ambition and the goals in terms of ecosystem extent or um, in terms of reducing threatened species and so that you would really be looking at the the link between those at the current time um, my understanding is that modeling some of the the goals will be difficult um, particularly the second one which relates to nature's contribution to people it might be difficult to fully get to the point where we're really able to to model that gap however at least this would start the process and this would be something that we as the secretariat could look at with the research community and identify a pathway for trying to do such a gap analysis most of the the modeling experience my view of the modeling experience globally most of that is held within the research community within research institutions and academic institutions and so there would really be a, a need for a coalition of people to come together to, to tell us, to tell the secretary and to tell the parties what is possible in terms of achieving this modeling and, and how this could really work. And this is something that would need to be fleshed out and certainly it would need to involve members of the, the modeling community so that we can make sure that this proposal um, is something that is achievable. Thanks. So um, if th there's w one more question, um, uh, Chair, if that's all right, and it's um, a question related to the, the country by country review, and it's a, a question about what um, what actually is the the format for this this country by country review um, that was mentioned. Thank you. So for those of you who uh, attended the the session in September, the the format of the review would be twofold. It would be that the countries that are under review would conduct an internal review. This is, it's really a sort of lessons learned of how things are going, what's worked so far, and how progress is being made towards the targets. Um, similar, I mean, the for those of you who did not attend the review, it's sort of a similar to the VPR process, only a, a shorter just analysis of, of where things stand. And then at the conclusion, of that would be a session, an experience sharing session, which would be conducted online, um, where the parties who participate in the review would, would present the experiences in under that review. They would also share a paper, which would follow a standard format. Um, there were a lot of comments from the September session on the need for having a standard format for these reviews that allow the experience sharing to be maximized. And, and then they would present this in a, a forum and, and then there would be discussion among parties. Um, currently, the observers would be able to listen in, but not participate in the providing feedback on the, the reviews. Thank you. Thank you. I, I do think that uh, if there are more questions, maybe we can come back to those. So I think we need to continue now to next presentations. So thank you once again for all questions and for the answers. And I think it's very valuable to have this opportunity to also clarify and try to understand this issue. So let us now move on to the next, next part of our session. And I would like to give the floor back to the Secretariat for the presentation on national reporting. So please, Secretary, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Um, the next 
I'm going to cover the national reporting element in the review mechanism, a package of review mechanism, um, you know, just mentioned by Jyoti and Jinian. And uh, I'm only, only uh, focus on the the main content of the document uh, CBD slash SBI slash three slash eleven slash at one. Uh, I'm going to share um, some of the initial thoughts or ideas uh, we have so far. Uh, we have now for national reporting of the uh, post 2020 period. As you know, that uh, these are the only uh, the proposals we have now, and then uh, these proposals will be further uh, developed, and including the um, the draft template for the seventh national report will be further developed based on the discussions and reviews uh, we we receive from SBI three and also the third meeting of the working group on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And, um, and, and then the revised uh, template for the seventh national report will be presented to COP15 for consideration and adoption. Uh, that's the process we uh, envision uh, from uh, here to uh, COP15. Uh, next slide, sweet. okay, yeah. Um, first of all, um, these uh, initial proposals were developed on the basis of the related uh, views and suggestions received so far from parties, uh, relevant organizations, and stakeholders. Uh, this include um, the submissions from parties and organizations with regard to the development of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, and also uh, the views um, from the relevant regional and the thematic consultations, uh, in particular, the thematic consultation on the monitoring, reporting, and reviewing of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework held uh, last February um, um, in Rome, and also um, from the first meeting and the second meeting of the working group, and then a few other major meetings on the convention, such as uh, SUBSTA 23 and the 11th uh, meeting of the working group of Article 8J. And, and this, uh, these are the very important basis for um, developing the proposals in this document. And of course, we also build on the, the experience and the lessons we learned from the six national reporting process and the earlier uh, rounds of national reporting. Next slide, please. Thank you. Next, uh, yeah. Uh, with regard to the experience and lessons we learned, and um, uh, we'd like to focus on a few uh, key challenges we noted uh, when we had a discussion with parties, and also, most importantly, we have reviewed all the reports uh, we received, and then uh, these are the key uh, mess, uh, challenges uh, uh, summarized here. And the first of all, and um, the many parties think that uh, the template could be shortened, and then focus on more on the the information essential for uh, the assessments of the progress towards the H targets. And uh, the second. Uh, some of the parties noted that uh, you know uh, there are some sections in the template they are overlapping, uh, so making the um, preparation and aggregation challenging. The, for example, you know um, the information on the implementation measures uh, provided in the section two, and then the parties have to new use this information again in the section three and a section. Four four to assess the progress towards national and global targets. So, and, and, and then also um, the uh, parties uh, noted that, you know, um, uh, the, on the assessments of the effectiveness of these measures, uh, they find it's very difficult to do it because the, um, the, they don't have the tools or approaches to do these kind of assessments. 
and and then and then the um, the parties also find analysis of a national contribution to uh, the progress of the global targets are also very challenging. Uh, this is uh, required requested in section four, and because m most of parties they they can do their national assessments, but they cannot do uh, they do not have the uh, global picture of the implementation. So that's very difficult to do the analysis of national contribution. And, um, and the other point is that the, the use of the indicators are still uh, um, very challenging to uh, many parties. Uh, even the, um, the use of the indicators uh, is increased in the six national report. And, um, and finally, um, you know, this time we ask parties to um, use the online reporting to, uh, tool to, to do the re reporting, but there are some still have some uh, uh, challenges and, uh, and a number of issues need to be further addressed and improved. And uh, we did a um, survey in the November of 2019, and the results of the survey were, uh, will be provided in the doc one of the INF document for SBI 3. Next slide, please. Um, and as I mentioned that, uh, you know, the proposals in this document, you know, were de developed uh, on the basis of the views and suggestions we received from submissions, consultations, and major meetings. And all this uh, have been summarized in the related documents prepared for the uh, working group of the post-2020 biodiversity framework and other uh, related um, thematic consultation workshops and others. Uh, here, I just want to uh, highlight uh, a few key suggestions and uh, related to the national reporting for the post-2020 period, post period. First, um, almost all the parties um, think that the national reporting should continue to be the main instruments for monitoring and review of the implementation of post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And they also agree that the national reporting uh, should be, uh, need to be uh, more effective, robust, and, and more transparent so as to provide adequate information for review uh, progress and identify the gaps and also uh, scaling up the actions. So to this end, Many parties suggest that the future national reports should focus on the information essential for review mechanisms and focus on the outcomes and impacts of actions and the gaps in the commitments and implementation. And also they think that the information provided in the national reports should be value added to the global staking, improving uh, transparency and enhancing implementation. Um, and, and then for the, the indicators, uh, many parties suggest that the, a core common uh, set of the headline indicators should be used by all parties um, to, to do the assessments of the progress. Um, that will be help um, the global um, uh, analysis and aggregation of the progress. Uh, with regard to the, um, the format for the national reports, many parties think that the, the, the format should be simple, uh, easy to use, and consistent and for the better tracking progress. And uh, for the um, reporting cycles, uh, most of the parties think that we should maintain the two regular reports for a decade and it probably could be a, a common, sorry, com complemented with. Uh, voluntary update reports. And, and also uh, many parties uh, stress that the importance of allowing relevant stakeholders, in particular indigenous peoples and in local communities to contribute the inputs to the national reports so that the national reports could reflect the complete uh, picture of the implementation in, in the country. And, and lastly, um, many countries underline the need for uh, adequate resources and capacity development support to provide to them, uh, to allow them to prepare and submit national reports in time. And uh, also some countries 
stress the need to uh, increase the synergies and to reporting um, the related conventions and also alignment reporting to the conventions and protocols. Okay, sorry. Uh, these are the uh, key views um, we have um, uh, would like to hi highlight, and this also uh, a very important basis for uh, developing the proposals uh, in this document and also the, the template for uh, the seventh national report. Uh, so next slide, please. So on the basis of this, um, all this uh, secretariat proposed of the principles uh, for developing the uh, elements of the draft template for a seventh national report. Uh, these are the main uh, considerations. The first one, uh, the format of the seventh national report will uh, build on the one for the sixth national report, will continue to use the template with the questionnaire uh, and the multiple choices and the space uh, for narrative combined, uh, because this has proven uh, good for use by parties and also good for uh, the analysis by the secretary later on. And second, for the content of the report, um, all we suggest that all the parties will report on the progress towards the global goals and the targets contained in the uh, post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, drawing upon the information from a national implementation of the Convention, the Strategic Plan for Biodiversity 2120, because uh, uh, you know this is um, uh, something we probably cover, uh, you need to cover in the seventh national, because the sixth national report was submitted in the, in the, um, in the 20, sorry, 2018. Um, and then, uh, of course, you know, you also need to build, uh, draw upon information of the national implementation of uh, post-2020 global biodiversity framework, and also the MBSAPs, and as well as the actions taken by relevant stakeholders. So um, in doing this kind of assessment of the progress, the, we suggest that parties will uh, focus on the outcomes, the gaps in the national ambition, and then implementation and the needs uh, for further actions. And to make um, the, the assessments based on a scientific basis, we, uh, we suggest that parties will use a, a common set of indicators to support the assessments, um, um, so the you know as for the, the the value of these indicators, you know some of them already uh, available um, from the relevant uh, global, regional, or national databases, and then online in an online tool, then this kind of in, value of indicators could be um, pre-populated there, and then the parties just use them, and uh, and and could could validate it, and then you know, uh, and and then uh, correct them if if they need it, and uh, and then uh, we believe that uh, it's believed that the this the information provided in the seventh national report will be useful for uh, global uh, review and start taking, um, and then and uh, as an initial report for the post 2020 uh, global biodiversity framework, the report will be concise. And will be short, and and also uh, when we uh, prepare the online reporting tool, uh, we also need to think about how we're going to help countries to increase the synergies into the uh, to reporting to um, uh, the related conventions, probably through the the, the data and reporting tool uh, called Data, uh, being developed by uh, UNEP, and and also you could see uh, some more options proposed for this in the document prepared for uh, CBD, also related to uh, the synergies, and uh, is uh, SBI 3 and 11 at 2. Uh, but I don't, I'm not going to um, uh, uh, work on, uh, say any more detail on this, and uh, these are the some of options proposed there as well. And, um, okay, next slide, please. Uh, let me move on. Uh, let me move on to the pro proposed uh, elements for the draft template and um, I just give you some ideas what this template is look uh, looks like 
and um, and uh, in terms of the overall structure of the template, uh, uh, we have uh, we propose uh, five sections uh, for uh, the seventh national port, and you can see from here the most important part is the section four, where the parties uh, are requested to do uh, uh, to make an initial assessments of the progress towards the uh, 2030 uh, milestones and action targets. Uh, I just want to say that we use the 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 update of the zero draft of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework now, and and then of course if uh, we need to make some changes when uh, the the final framework is adopted. Um, next slide, please. And and then I just give you an, a very quick uh, overview of the uh, the main uh, information requested in the section four. And um, uh, first one is the status of the national targets. And then of course, if you if you identified any uh, gaps in the, your national ambitions, we hope that you could uh, provide some of these uh, in information and and analysis. And then the second um, parties uh, will be required to provide the value of headline indicators, and then you know, of course, related to the the, the target you are you are reporting on, and and then based on the the value of the indicators, and then uh, parties uh, are, are asked to indicate uh, the level of the progress. And of course, you know, we provide a few categories for uh, for choice, and you select one of them. Uh, and and then these kind of assessments uh, will be supported uh, with some additional information and um, uh, more about the actions taken to achieve this target. And of course, you know, we like to the parties to focus more on the on the outcomes and impacts of the actions. And of course, if the parties has done um, some analysis of the effectiveness of the actions, uh, we hope that the the parties will provide some more information on that. Um, this is uh, different from the from the section national report. You don't need to have a very detailed discussion uh, about a description of the actions. You just have a very uh, uh, simple um, um, outline of the actions and by the focus on the outcomes achieved. And uh, and finally, of course, you know the, the analysis. Uh, you, when you do, uh, you could also um, do analysis of the challenges encountered. And of course, we provide a list. Uh, you could select from the list, and then you could elaborate on the challenges you have selected. And of course, you could, if you have a very good uh, stories, a successful story to share, that will be perfect. Uh, so these are the the main. Um, Information items um, you will uh, parties are, 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 are requested to cover in in the section um, uh, four. So the actually these are the main things you need to cover in the seventh national report. For others, mostly you just um, just tick tick and then provide some additional information in a very concise way. Uh, so um, finally. Um, with regard to the timeline, as Julianne already mentioned, that uh, you know for the seventh national report uh, submission, we have we propose the June uh, 2024 um, because you know the the reason is um, the the uh, COP 15 is is postponed, and you know that uh, the COP 14 27 recommended 2023 is a starting year for uh, synchronization of reporting to the convention. To the protocols, uh, but I guess now we, uh, it's not realistic to ask parties to submit a uh, seventh national report in 2023 if if um, the COP15 is uh, postponed. And and uh, I, I just want to say that um, the seventh national report is very uh, important um, for the review of the post implementation of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. And of course, the O7 National also could contribute to the review of ND, sorry, uh, SDGs and also other conventions 
uh, because you know the the global biodiversity framework is intended to provide the strategic guidance for other related conventions as well. And of course, the seventh national port will uh, contribute to GBO six, and then probably uh, the global commitment uh, gap report uh, mentioned by Julianne. And um, so, um, as I said, that uh, very beginning, uh, the national porting is one of the uh, the elements of the proposed enhanced uh, review mechanism. And uh, so, um, sorry, uh, next slide, please. Sorry. Karen, uh, next slide. So these are the, some of the documents uh, we have prepared. And uh, in addition to this chapeau document and this at one, and we have at two, all about national reports. And then uh, in three uh, covers the results of the online reporting tool. And then there are um, a few other documents related to the, uh, to the um, um, indicators, uh, which will be covered in, the, in a webinar uh, next Tuesday. Uh, so these are the highlights of the document at one we have prepared for national reporting. And um, so if you have uh, any questions, and I'm very happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, Lia, for the presentation. And uh, it was also very informative. Before we come back to question and answers, I would like to hand back over to the Secretariat for a presentation on national commitments. And following this presentation, we will address any questions you have on both presentations. So, Secretariat, Nadine, you have the floor. Hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, colleagues. It's good to be here. I'm going to share my screen so that you can see, hopefully, my presentation. Please let me know, someone, if, if and when yes, you can see it. I, I can see it, so go ahead. Okay, okay so, oops. Can you still see it? I can still see it. Okay, no, I can't see it. Just one second. Sorry about this. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a document that is not posted yet, but it will be very soon. And it's about further information and possible template for the national commitments to the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. Now, I've structured my presentation around some of the main questions that um, emerge when one starts thinking about um, such a thing, national commitments. So I, I'll just walk through them. There's not very many of them. There's about eight, I think. Um, so the first one is, what are national commitments? So basically, the idea is that these would be national targets responding to each one of the global targets. Um, these would be submitted by all parties within within one year after the adoption of the global biodiversity framework they would be new commitments or existing and ongoing commitments that are relevant to the goals and targets of the global biodiversity framework preferably these national commitments or national targets as we wish to call them would be measurable um, and quantifiable and it would be encouraged that these commitments would be not only from the environment sector, but also from other sectors that have a bearing on biodiversity. Um, also joint commitments with subnational and non-state actors would be encouraged. Another question and very important one is, why national commitments? Where is this proposal coming from? So as my colleagues before me have stated, um, the the idea of national commitments was discussed and proposed um, numerous times in the post 2020 consultations in the submissions in the post 2020 um, process also and it it also um, emerges from some of the experiences and lessons that we've learned from our previous round of national targets and mbsaps etc so why national commitments the first reason is because of the urgency of political commitment and action. Um, 
we know that we have a need for heightened ambition and heightened action as soon as possible but we can't just hope that this will happen we need to have a way of knowing if it's happening and so one way of doing that is being able to aggregate and and measure to know you know are we measuring up to the global ambition yes or no if no then we will have some time to be able to um to correct our course and do something about it. Um, another reason is because, as as many of you, or most of you probably know, a genuine MBSAP process is a very valuable process at the national level, but it can be lengthy. So what happened in the in the pre post 20, well, in the post 10, 2010 or post Nagoya um, period? we had a 2015 deadline set by IG Target 17 that was for 2015 the MBSAPs should be revised and submitted. What happened is we only had 69 of those by the time of the deadline. So this, um, it, you know, it's very important to have the, the, the synchronizing with national processes and this is why so we have a, a little bit of a double-edged sword or a, or a contradiction between the urgency um, of the political commitment to the to the global framework and then the the respect or the or the or the understanding let's say of for the the need to synchronize with national processes which which may take longer than 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 what we have um, Another consideration that, that we had is that many existing MBSAPs are valid beyond 2020. In fact, many of them are valid until 2030. Now, on the, on the other side of that, we have many that, that do expire in 2020. So how do we manage um, to, have, to accommodate both these, these situations and everything in between? And then finally, as, and as I, I believe Gillian and, and Lee Jay both mentioned, um, the situation that we had with the post-Nagoya um, national targets is that they came in so many different, um, you know, in, in all the possible variations possible, and, and that's a, a very um, true um, reflection of the, of the differences and variety of situations we have in the countries, but this on the uh, the other side of this is that it makes it very difficult to aggregate and analyze um, to see to get really an adequate picture of what we have at the global level and and in a timely fashion. So those are just some of the reasons why um, national commitments have have, have become an, an important part of this proposal that's being put forth to SBI. Now another. Um, you know, key question, and I think actually one of the questions that we had before the before Lee Jay's presentation and after after um, Gillian's was, what is the relationship um, between national commitments and um, and MBSAPs and other national planning processes? So the idea is that national commitments would be the what. So what are you going to what are you going to achieve in relation to these global targets? And the MBSAPs would be how are you going to how are you going to achieve that? And so these two things, you know, we could see them really as not two things, but if they are two things or two instruments or whatever we want to call them, um, they're very intricately intricately linked. Now it's important to mention here we we we're very aware and everyone knows we have Article Six of the Convention. Um, that, that mandates the development of MBSAP by each party. Um, so this will remain, the MBSAPs will re would remain the main uh, national planning instrument under the convention. And they would be revised as needed to align with and support the achievement of the party's national commitments. So to continue with the relationship um, with MBSAPs. Um, as you know, also we have a lot of guidance on MBSAPs and, and there's certain things that that um, the guidance says that MBSAPs should contain. Among them, actions that, party, that parties will take to achieve their national targets. Now, ideally in, in the post-2020 um, MBSAPs, we would have action plans that have specific timings, locations, resources, actors, etc. Um, 
I just put here the guidance in decision 9.8 and other that you know tell us that the MBSUP should align with national processes. They should consider um, capacity development, resource mobilization, the different means of implementation and other efforts. So that's just a bit of a reminder that we're not deviating. Like this is this is is still all valid um, guidance on MBSUPs. So when and how would national commitments be submitted? This has been already answered in part by Gillian, but just to repeat um, a little bit, the, the submission of, of national commitments will be an opportunity for parties to show their leadership and their po political will towards the new framework. Now, um, many parties have already made biodiversity commitments in 2020, and in 2021 and 22, there'll be many opportunities in order to do this quite publicly. Um, at the high level segment, at COP15, the World Conservation um, Congress, UNEA, the HLPF, among others. Um, but apart from these, you know, possibly it's an option to, to take advantage of these opportunities to make a, a commitment quite publicly. There will also be um, a, a, a template for for the submission of the national commitments into a registry on the on the clearinghouse mechanism so this will be a standardized form um, which i will talk to you a little bit more about later on um, i think this is one of the last questions and that is the relationship of national commitments with subnational and non-state actor commitments so as we know subnational non-state actors have been um, making commitments through the Sharm el Sheikh to coming action agenda for nature and people. Um, this will continue, um, and the idea would be that that such commitments would be included if if they were made in the standard format. Um, they would be included in the analysis and aggregation that would be made for the global gap report that that Gillian mentioned in the beginning. Um, these commitments by non-state and subnational actors could um, be reflected in parties, um, so national governments, national commitments, um, but this would be at the discretion of each, each party. So there is um, a forthcoming information document specifically on this topic, so I, I won't speak any more to it, but just um, keep your eyes open for that one. So, um, just very quickly, so this is a very early um, idea of what the possible template for national commitments um, would look like or could look like. Um, in the beginning, there would be a request for general information. So, which parties is submitting this commitment? Are there non-state actors that are also part of this commitment? They're also committing to in you know together. Um, which is the national government authority that is responsible or accountable for this commitment? Is this commitment a new commitment or has it already been um, committed in another fora maybe? So there, there'll be a drop down menu for that. And then the second part would be the actual na national commitment that would be made for each of the global targets. So I put global target one, but this would be repeated for each of the ones. So um, there would be a space to actually write what the national commitment is. Um, then it would be an ex a short explanation of how this commitment contributes to the global target. Um, there'll be an option to add one or two or three actions that would be taken to achieve this national target. Um, then other n n relevant targets that, so if, you know, even though it will be submitted, this one will be for target one, but you could also tag other targets. And finally, um, if the party determines that that national target, so in this case target one, is not relevant to, circum to national circumstances, there would be an opportunity to explain briefly. So that is all for now. Um, I'd be very happy to take any questions. Um, yeah, back to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadine, and thank you, Secretary, for both presentations. We will now commence a question and answer portion of this item. And uh, just to remind you, if in order to ask a question, please use the question window located at the right of your screen. 
When asking the question, please remember to include your name and party or organization affiliation. And I'm pretty sure we do have questions already now. So please, Kieran, if you can read out the questions. Certainly, Chair. So um, a, a few questions related to commitments. Um, so one question is um, related to the link between national commitments and those from other stakeholders. And, and the question is, how do we avoid um, a double counting type of situation? So I, I guess that would be a, a question for Nadine on the relationship between um, national commitments on the one hand and stakeholder commitments on the other. And in, in aggregating those or in, in analyzing those, how do we make sure that we don't count things twice? Right, so so if if a national commitment is includes a non-state actor, then it depends where it's submitted and how it's submitted. So we, we would definitely have to make sure that um, a non-state actor doesn't submit both with their national government and separately. And if they do, we would cut, we would have a way of catching that and not counting it twice. So we we would need to sort out ways of of doing this. I don't know exactly exactly how, but that's um, it's, it's a consideration for sure. So then um, an, another question on um, commitments. So I, I guess this would also be for Nadine. Um, and it's a question on um, what these commitments are likely to look like. So are they are these general commitments or are they broad commitments or are they more like a, a national target contributing to the post-2020 global biodiversity framework? So as, uh, as we mentioned in, in the presentations, the idea would be that national commitments would be um, specific to each of the global targets. Um, so yes, they would they would look like national targets, or they would be national targets that would be specifically contributing to each one of the global targets. So it wouldn't be one commitment saying yes, we agree with the global framework and and we will implement it all. Um, it will be very much more specific to each of the targets. So then there's a, um, another question, and it um, again has to do with the relationship between NBSAPs and, and, and national contributions or, or commitments. Um, and the, the question is, um, so, you know, considering that, you know, countries have NBSAPs um, and different national processes, and there is now a suggestion for a national commitment process, what should the focus be on immediately after COP? Should the after COP, the focus be on revising the NBSAP or on preparing a commitment? So it, it, this will be different in different countries, but in essence, um, the reason why we're talking about national commitments right now is because um, the way it's being proposed in the Chapeau document is that national commitments will need to be submitted within one year of the adoption of the framework. So in cases where, for example, you've just submitted your MBSAP a year ago and it's valid up, you know, valid its date is up to 2030, you wouldn't jump in and start revising your MBSAP right, right away. But the adoption of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework will be an opportunity for you to, to have a process, a political process in your country where, where you, the government will make a commitment would decide for each target what are they willing to commit to to doing to achieving yeah so um that would be the first thing to do now if your mbsap is expired and you know it, it's no longer valid and you know nobody knows what to do now because there's no mbsap which you know I, personally I think is unlikely but but in that case then you would do both things at the same time yeah okay Th thank you Nadine um Kirian do we have more questions or um so there are two questions left 
um, and they're sort of on on related um, on a related issue. So perhaps what I could do is I, I'll read them out, and then um, perhaps um, perhaps uh, I, I, well, Jyoti or, or David may may want to respond may want to respond to them. Um, so the 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 question is, or the first question is, there are some uh, contents in the documents that are um, sort of proposed as mandatory, and the the question is, how do we legally or how do we specify actually what mandatory means in the in the in the post twenty twenty global biodiversity framework? Um, and then the the next question is, um, NBCEPs are the main tool for parties to plan their domestic work, and it's you know provided in the articles of the CBD, um, and this tool reflects commitments from parties. So. Would the secretariat clarify the legal status of national commitments and what is the approach to incorporate the commitments into the NBCEP? So um, two questions sort of related to more um, legal issues as to, on the, the, the sort of the, the legal status of what any commitments um, uh, may be. Thank you. Thanks a lot, um, uh, Kieran. Um, so what I can say about these um, about these um, national commitments or contributions is that first of all, um, this is something that uh, you know has been um, has come out of all the discussions that we have had at um, you know the Rome consultation through submissions uh, and through various other fora, um, and th these are all proposals. So the parties have to first decide what path they want to take. And once the pathways, a path is decided, um, then we they could request uh, the secretariat or others or themselves uh, undertake a um, under, undertake an analysis of what what this legally means for uh, parties. And I'm sure um, I'm not sure, but I think, um, that um, there will be different implications legally for different uh, systems of government and for different uh, uh, parties and different, um, uh, you know, because uh, because uh, each government has different um, um, constitutions and uh, requirements. So I think that this will be uh, really a country by country on a country by country basis. But we could undertake a legal analysis once um, once parties decide what path to choose. Uh, but perhaps David has uh, also, uh, in his wrap up, he could also provide some um, background on this. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jyoti. Okay, I I, I do think uh, if there are no more questions. I will I just like to thank you all for all valuable questions and I hope that you have got some responses that are more clarifying and then and we as already said we hope it will be helpful for you all to prepare for SPI free. But I would now like to invite the Deputy Sec Secretary Mr David Cooper to provide his reflections on the discussion. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Charlotte, and thank you for the, all the presenters, uh, and thank you for everyone participating uh, in this in this webinar. Um, I think uh, certainly we've I think found it very useful to um, hear these 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 questions to help to prepare for the um, for the. SPI, both the informal session coming up and then and then the formal session. And as um, we mentioned at the beginning, we've heard from many parties that this issue of improving the the reporting, monitoring, and uh, review mechanisms is something that that many many parties think is going to be a major part of the post 2020 uh, architecture. Um, we know, as Jyoti mentioned at the beginning, from the Global Biodiversity outcome, uh, Outlook, that um, while there's a lot of, of, of progress made and nearly all countries developed their NBSAPs, there were time lags. 
uh, in the development of those NVSAPs. It, um, most of them were coming around five or so years after the adoption of the Aichi targets uh, in Nagoya. And we also know from the analyses in GBO and also the analyses um, that are presented to SBI and Agenda Item 3 that the targets, the national targets um, that were set were generally not commensurate with the, the global targets. And hence the um, interest in, in strengthening this process and in putting uh, more emphasis on the alignment of, we can call them national targets, we can call them national commitments, we can call them national contributions to the global target. And that's the important thing really, that the um, commitments made by, by countries nationally would be aligned with and, and, and you could see how they are intended to contribute to achieving global targets. Um, and of course, we're not starting from scratch here. We did, uh, after Nagoya, have uh, um, the intention at least to have this, this system of where countries would first set their national targets and then update the, uh, their NBSAPs incorporating these national targets. Um, many, many countries did that for many targets, but um, as we noted, the, the, the problem was the lag times. Uh, and so, a delay in getting started. And then the problem was that often those national targets were not well aligned with the, with the global targets. And so a lot of this uh, is to try and improve that alignment. I, I want to just mention one other thing before I then touch on the, the legal issues that have been um, raised. And, and that is, yes, this is the purpose of this, is to support transparency, is to, is to identify gaps so that those gaps can then be closed, we hope. But the ultimate purpose of this is obviously then to support implementation and strengthen implementation. And an, another important element of that will be the learning that goes on among parties as we, as we move forward. So the sharing of information on what's working and what's not. And so that's why we have also as part of this multidimensional review, the country by country review, the party led review. Um, so just on the um, these legal issues and the, 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 the sense to which any of these things can be mandatory, of course, in the convention itself, you know, uh, the mandatory element is essentially reporting. So um, the, I think in the in, in the in the document 311, mandatory is the word mandatory is used three times. One is just to describe the mandatory national reporting process, which is part of the, the convention. Uh, another reference to it is, is actually just referring to views of parties. So the only other in incidence is with the reference to headline indicators. And we've heard a lot of suggesting that um, there should be a core set of indicators that are common across, across parties. A lot of this on indicators will be discussed at the uh, Substa webinar next week, as, 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 as you've heard. Now, we expect the, the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework to be adopted through a COP decision. And COP decisions are not used and, and tend to not use bind, legally binding language. Uh, there's been, I think, one exception, which is in the context of national reports. So. Um, in this sense, um, it's unlikely that um, any element of this would be legally binding, except, of course, for the existing um, legally binding requirement to, to report. But I think there is, there is a difference between, if we look at indicators, for instance, of, you know, those that may, may be recommended in general and those where there's perhaps an expectation that uh, all parties will try and meet so that we can have a, a common and uh, a, a systematic um, approach and, uh, and, and a meaningful assessment of the overall, of the overall progress. Um, so I think uh, I would leave it there just to say that um, obviously we look forward to the continued 
discussions on this issue as we prepare for the informal session of um, SBI in a few weeks' time, where all parties will have the opportunity to present their positions uh, on this issue, and we'll have opportunity to learn from stakeholders as well. And then when we move to the formal uh, um, meetings of SBI later, uh, to make uh, clear recommendations on this issue. So thank you all very much. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you very much, David. And dear colleagues, this now brings us to the end of today's webinar. Thank you all for participating today. And thank you all for all questions and comments. I hope that you have found the webinar informative and that it will be helpful in your preparation for SBI Pre. I also hope that many of you will participate in the webinars next week, after a uh, week after, related to SAP 24. So please register if you, have, if you have not done that yet. I would also like to, to thank uh, Mr. David Cooper, the Deputy Executive Secretary, and his team for preparing for and organizing the session today. Thanks for all presentations. And again, thank you all for joining us today. This webinar is now concluded. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Bye, everyone.